So the next speaker Professor Paul Glitcher. Uh, Professor Glitcher is a Julius Silver a professor of natural neuroscience uh, in NYU and the director of the Institute of Interdisciplinary Studies of Decision Making, uh, directly related to neuroeconomy. And he will be giving a talk on the uh, decision making from the neural basis of our preferences to the neural mechanism of our errors. Professor Glincher. Well, thank you, Mu Ming, for being a, such a gracious host to us today. I, want, I know I speak for everyone in both the New York, uh, NYU New York community and the NYU Shanghai community and saying that we're all super excited to be here today. Neuroeconomics has been a huge thrust at New York University in the New York campus, and we really look forward in the next few years to projecting that expertise and ability, not just, we hope, to the NYU Shanghai campus that we're building, but also to the larger Shanghai community. And that's, of course, one of the reasons we're so excited about being here today. I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about the history of neuroeconomics as I experienced it. And this is really, I think, the first neuroeconomics meeting. It took place in 2001. And you may recognize many of these scholars who got together for a weekend to discuss the possibility that the time was ripe to begin studying the economic behavior of humans using neuroscientific tools. And at the time, that was, of course, thought a completely crazy idea. But if we fast forward to 2014, we see the existence of many, many centers for decision making and neuroscience and economics all over the United States and Europe. Here I'm showing you a 10-year-old plot of all of the major neuroeconomics research teams, where these are anywhere from two investigators to someplace like NYU with 40. Now, uh, these, these people study lots of different things. And of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the community, which we've always tried to promote. There are people doing economic studies, thinking about consumers and markets. There are people who are at heart psychologists, thinking about healthy subjects and their behavior, as well as the behaviors of patients. There are more traditional neurobiologists looking at the neural basis of decision making. And of course, there are clinicians who are asking fundamental questions about how we put together disease states with decision making to better understand how to perform new treatments. But I think what all of these different communities share and what we really hope today we'll be able to begin to build in Shanghai is a conviction that each of these groups of people can help each other through the scholarly interaction of neuroeconomics. Now, of course, that's not a new idea. Uh, neuroeconomics has just grown asymptotically over the course of the last decade or so. Here I'm plotting number of annual publications in the PubMed database, and you can see here in 1990 just a few papers, mostly from Antonio Damasio's group, that become really asymptotic. This is 2012 with almost a thousand publications that use the words decision making and neuroscience or neuroeconomics in them. And so we have every expectation that over the course of the next decade, this will become one of the dominant fields of interdisciplinary study at the edge of the social and natural sciences. And we think that China is a really exciting place to make that growth happen faster and more powerfully. And I think that the interest today really indicates how true that is. I want to stress again how interdisciplinary the, this project is. Here I'm showing you a map of journals. Each one of these dots is an academic journal. Its size indicates the number of neuroeconomics papers that were published in it. Its color, the discipline, from economics to psychology to the cognitive sciences to the biomedical sciences. And of course, the connections are the citation patterns. And what you see is not one cluster or two clusters or three clusters studying separately, but a continuous smooth map where all of these disciplines, even now only 10 or 12 years into neuroeconomics, demonstrate this clean structural feature of an emerging discipline. And not only is it true of the discipline, in the discipline at large, but it turns out to be true of the research groups who work in this discipline. Here we're showing the diversity 
um, neuroeconomics research groups, so some of the main neuroeconomics research groups. This is essentially the number of investigators in a group. This is how much they're social scientists, how much they're natural sciences, or how much they're balanced. And this is their centrality to that graph theoretic representation, how centered they are in, in imp impactful neuroeconomics. And you can see it's the groups that lie in the center that mix insights from economics, psychology, neuroscience, that have higher citation rates and that have larger impact and that lie more centrally in the knowledge theoretic representation of our discipline. So that I wanted to give as a brief overview and I, I hope it communicates at least my motivation or the motivation of the NYU community in trying to begin to move aggressively to build competence and interest in neuroeconomics research in China and beyond in Asia. But having said that, I do want to take a moment to talk about research and I wanted to do that in two steps. I wanted to give this, this audience, many of whom probably don't know that much about neuroeconomics, an overview of the sort of standard model that's emerged in the last uh, 10 years of how it is that we make decisions. I'll talk about just a couple of classic papers and give you an overview of basically how you make decisions. This is interesting to neuroscientists and in my experience not to social scientists. And the reason is because social scientists say, well, that's great, that's how it works. How do I use that information to strengthen economics or psychology? And in the second half, I'll give you just one example from my uh, research group of how with that kind of information in hand, we can perform very technical and sophisticated analysis of information processing, identify new classes of behavior that people and animals ought to make, show that they actually make them, and then even show you ways to fix them, to repair errors in behavior. So with that introduction, let me move quickly to giving you a, a basic overview of the choice mechanism, the decision-making mechanism. Speaking very broadly, maybe too broadly, the view has emerged that we can think of a group of frontal and basal ganglia areas as encoding values. These are areas where we store, learn, and represent the desirability of objects we will encounter in our lives. These are, of course, heavily predicated on inputs from neurobiological systems like the dopamine system of the midbrain. And the insight is that for many kinds of behavior, these brain areas project out to a cluster of motor areas. And it, for many behaviors, it appears that it, the decision itself actually takes place th with a, uh, through the interaction of these representation of value areas and these cluster of motor areas. Now that's, that's an idea really that I put forward about 10 years ago and I think it's often thought of as the basic model, a ch uh, representational system and a choice system, but really exciting new work now, of course, is beginning to show that I got that completely wrong and argue that many of the choice operators can also be found in these brain areas and I'll mention that in a moment. Now, if we zoom in to those choice areas, those blue areas, I'm going to select out really the first place that decision-making was studied, and that is in parietal area LIP. Now, this is really, I think, widely cited as the first neuroeconomics paper. It's work by my then postdoc, Michael Platt, who, uh, of course, grew up to be the director of neuroscience, who will someday grow up to be the president of Duke University, but in the moment, at the moment makes do with merely being the director of their neuroscience programs. And what Michael did was recording from a single LIP neuron, which was interested in a monkey making a decision to look from straight ahead to the right. While recording from that neuron, he taught the monkey essentially to play roulette. So what happens is uh, two roulette targets, a red and a green one, illuminate. After a brief delay, the fixation light, this is essentially spinning the roulette wheel, turns either red or green. And the monkey now knows that if he looks at this target, he'll collect a reward. And all Michael did was to vary the amount of reward associated with this target. And what he found was that the neurons in LIP quite precisely encode the magnitude of reward that the monkey expects to receive for that movement, showing a high rate of responding when the monkey expects a large reward and a low rate of responding when the monkey expects a small reward, and in fact going on to demonstrate that in this brain area, the relationship between firing rate and the value of the reward is largely linear within a fixed domain. 
And many, many studies in my lab and other labs have expanded on this idea over the course of the last decade. And I want to remind you of something very important as we begin to think about what this looks like in the brain. Here I'm showing you a picture I've borrowed from David Van Essen. This is, of course, a human, an MR of a human brain being inflated and flattened. I'm reminding you that this human cerebral cortex, the monkey cerebral cortex as well, are basically flat sheets of cells. And area LIP, or its human equivalents, IPS1 and IPS2, live up in about this region of the flat sheet. Now that's important because we can take a look at the flat, sh flat sheet and ask, what are the neurons doing in one of these representational sheets during the decision-making process? And th there's so many studies that I'm just aggregating a lot of data now to show you what that looks like in a computer representation generated by one of my postdocs, Ryan Webb. So here we're looking at LIP. We're actually looking at right and left LIP stitched together to make it easier. This is 100 by 500 neurons. And what we're going to be looking at here is what the monkey sees when we offer him a juice reward for looking to the right. And you can see we have a, regional, a region of activity on the right-hand side, a peak indicating the location of the target to which the monkey will later look. But the critical idea is that the heights of these peaks represent the desirability of these two options to the animal. So when a highly desirable option appears, it generates more activity in these maps. And when an undesirable option appears, it generates less activity in these maps which of course means that these are really maps of how much you like stuff. And the process of choosing is simply reading off the highest peak from one of these maps. Now we know quite a lot about the biophysics of how that's accomplished at this point. We know that short range excitatory connections seem to become enhanced at the time of the decision, which causes the peaks to compete through long range inhibitory connections, ultimately leading to a winner take all process and the selection of a single movement. Now, I've told this story as if a single brain area does it. Let me stress that that's not the case. Many brain areas participate in this process, and these brain areas are all heavily interconnected. Not all are necessary for all kinds of decisions, but the general idea here seems to be pretty solid at this point. There are topographic maps in the brain of what we like to think of as decision variables. There are biophysical mechanisms that allow the brain, the cortical sheet, to make comparisons between these decision variables. And that process of comparison is the process of making a choice. Now, of course, what I was telling you about is the process of making a choice. And I haven't yet told you anything about how we construct and represent values in the brain. This has also been an area of tremendous inquiry in neuroeconomics over the course of the last decade. And many, many labs have devoted themselves to understanding where and how values are represented in the brain and how they are projected out into the decision-making circuits. One fact has really emerged in these studies. I'm hoping my slide will start. Ah, yeah. One fact has really emerged in many of these studies. There have now been about 250 studies of how, using fMRI of how value is represented in the brain. And the fact that has emerged in essentially all of them is that a single common brain area appears to represent the last step in cortical processing it is what we like to call the final common path for value representation in these kinds of choice tasks I'm describing today. And it is the medial prefrontal cortex. Now, as Michael Platt may tell you, it turns out that there are important other brain areas that allow us to weigh the value of acting and not acting, and that those circuits interdigitate with these. But as soon as we start talking about the simplest problem, how is it that we find in the brain the representation of value that is then taken by the choice circuits and used to make a choice, as soon as we do that, we get an extremely clear answer. This is my old student Joe Cable's lab's work on this. He performed a 206 paper meta study published last year, and here you can see the medial prefrontal cortex. Now, I haven't told you about the basal ganglia. There's a second final common valuation area, and that is the ventral striatum, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Now, we understand this so well that we can take someone into the brain scanner, and show them consumer goods. For example, this DVD of the movie Madagascar, or this copy of a Monet. We, so we obviously don't use real Monets in the lab. <laughs> then we can pull the person out of the brain scanner and ask, how active is that person's medial prefrontal cortex? 
This is an NYU New York undergraduate who shows a high activity for this blank notebook and unfortunately a strong degree of suppression for a Beethoven CD. This is really interesting because you really learn something about your undergraduates. Once we do that, we take the undergraduate out of the brain scanner and we have them perform another experiment which is simply to choose between every pair of the 20 objects we've shown them. And we ask, can we use the MPFC activity measurement with fMRI to accurately predict what they'll choose later? This was work of my former postdoc Ifat Levy, now, uh, now a professor at Yale. Now it should be obvious in thinking about this that our predictions ought to be quite accurate when we compare the first ranked object with the last ranked object and our predictions ought to be quite poor, maybe because the preferences are not very strong when we compare two adjacent objects. And in fact, in this two, three-year-old study, that's exactly what we found. Here I'm plotting you, for you in the MPFC the percent correct as a function of the distance between the two items in preference space. And you can see that when the difference is large, in this study we could predict it about 85% correct. And when the distance is small, we operate at chance. Now this decrement in performance reflect, reflects two things, the subjects becoming indifferent between the objects and errors in the brain scanning measurement. We've studied both of those in quite a good, uh, quite a good deal of detail recently and have been really pushing on the MR technology. And I should tell you that in collaboration with a group at Maastricht, we've now been able to push up, or I should really say they've been able to push up the percent correct prediction to about the mid-90s at this point. So this is really impressive, I think that we can take people, put them in the scanner, show them consumer goods, record activity at this location, and then predict what they prefer with an accuracy of up to 95 percent. Okay, so I've told you something about what we've learned in the last decade, decade and a half in neuroeconomics. I've told you about how a series of areas seem to collaborate to generate something like a value, that this value comes to be represented, at least in simple choice tasks, in the medial prefrontal cortex, that a cluster of frontal parietal areas, which may project back down into these frontal areas as well, perform a winner-take-all process on mapped representations of these goods, and that that winner-take-all process, now quite well modeled biophysically, appears to be the physiological instantiation of making a decision. But of course, for me, as an economist, I'm both a neuroscientist and an economist, this puts us in a great place. And it allows to us to ask a, a very important question. Can we use this kind of understanding of the neurobiology of decision making to make fundamental progress in understanding human decision making behavior? Instead of just using behavior to guide us in studying the brain, can we use the brain to guide us in studying and understanding behavior? Now there are quite a few projects in the neuroscience landscape that have tried to accomplish that and some are beginning to succeed. I'm going to tell you about a collaborative one that I'm doing with uh, Professor Ken Wei Louie at NYU. And this is one that the two of us I think are super excited about as sort of being on the frontier of using neurobiology and this understanding of structure to better understand economic behavior. And this line of inquiry starts from an old neurophysiologic observation. For about 30 years now, we've known that the visual cortex does not simply represent, each neuron in the visual cortex does not simply represent what is in its receptive field. It represents what is in its receptive field influenced by the things outside the receptive field. And we typically model this interaction using a mathematical structure that David Heeger developed in the 1980s called divisive normalization. What David argued was that neurons in the visual cortex represent what is in their receptive field divided by a weighted sum of all of the other things near their receptive field. And what's interesting about this equation is it's now been observed to describe cortical processing not just in places like V1, but in places like higher order visual cortex, auditory cortex, essentially every sensory cortex in which there has been an effort to demonstrate that this is the representational scheme has succeeded in demonstrating that this is the representational scheme. And this led Ken Wei and I to ask whether or not this same representational scheme might occur in the representation of value by choice areas. Let me explain why the two of us thought that might be the case. 
Imagine I had a monkey and asked him to choose between one milliliter of fruit juice and 999 milliliters of fruit juice. And I used a fixed neural representation in neurons who could fire between 1 and 100 action potentials per second. Of course, what we'd find would be a low level of activity for the 1 milliliter fruit juice, let's call that 1 spike per second, and a high level of activity for the large offer of fruit juice, let's call that 99 spikes per second. Now, if we stop for a moment and change the question, asking the monkey to choose not between 1 and 1,000 milliliters, but between 1 and 2 milliliters, this system would now ask the monkey to tell the difference between, in his, with his winner-take-all system, one spike per second and 1.01 spikes per second. And of course, because neurons are stochastic and fluctuate randomly from moment to moment, this would take monkeys many seconds of sampling the data before they could effectively choose between one and two milliliters. And what this made us realize is that that can't be the way values are represented in cortex. Of course, if you think about the, uh, the cortical normalization story, it provides an immediate solution to this problem. If we ask the monkey to choose between one milliliter under conditions in which there are one or a thousand milliliters of juice, this denominator has a very large number on it, a very small number up here, and it results in a low firing rate. But if we ask the monkey to choose between one milliliter and two milliliters, this remains a one, but the denominator now switches from being 1,001 to being only 2, and the firing rate now effectively spreads so that the dynamic range of the neuron is well used to represent the options he is encountering. And of course, what we realized was that that implied that the neurons in LIP should use this kind of representation, that it would be efficient, and it suggested that the same rules that every other cortical area had been observed to follow with regard to representation might be observed in the parietal cortices of, in the parietal choice cortex of monkeys. Now, I'm not going to walk you through the whole experiment, but what Ken Wei and I did was design an experiment where monkeys were choosing between multiple options at different locations, so we would be dynamically varying both the numerator and the denominator in real time. And we asked how the firing rates of the neurons were influenced by changes essentially not in the numerator, the top of the fraction, but changes only in the bottom of the fraction. And this is the firing rate to a large reward offered to the monkey when that's the only thing that's being offered. And as we increase the value of offers outside the receptive field, the firing rate of this neuron declines. We can even show baseline suppression for people who are sort of visual cortical people. But the critical idea of this study was the observation that we can observe divisive normalization, this classic cortical computation, even in the choice cortices, and that it is an extremely efficient way to account for the data. I'm showing you the model that Michael and I proposed about 15 years ago, which suggested that what was represented in parietal cortex was the relative value of two options. Here I'm plotting the observed firing rates against the predicted firing rates for a database. This is the shadlin newsom model, which suggests that what is represented in choice circuits is the difference between two options. And here you can see the standard normalization model presented by uh, David Heger and John Reynolds, let's say five years ago. I want you to see how much better a job it does at predicting the firing rates of the data. And I have to tell you that this was considered, until this paper, really a superb prediction for the parietal firing rates. Now, I want to remind you of one last fact before we turn for just a few minutes to economics. And that is that neurons are noisy. Remember that neurons, when they fire, do not fire a fixed number of action potential. They, if they fire at 100, I, I can't say this except by being a physiologist. When I say to an undergraduate student, this neuron is firing at 10 hertz, they imagine in their head, and when, when a physiologist hears 10 hertz, they imagine, because these are Poisson-like devices. And we know that. We know that the variance is related to the mean. This is Tony Mobson's old proof of that from 1983. And of course, that is hugely important because it means that when a monkey's making a decision, he's drawing an observation from a distribution of possible firing rates. Consider a system in which the firing rate is specifically tied to milliliters of juice. 
and we offer a monkey a choice between this amount of juice represented in the blue distribution and this amount of juice represented in the black distribution, what we're really telling the monkey is, go check in the firing rates in your brain, draw one observation from the blue distribution, one from the black. You'll get it wrong where they overlap, but that's okay. That's going to make you look a little variable in your behavior. And that's just going to be the choice mechanism. Everyone should be, I hope, good with that idea. Now imagine we add a third option. In an absolute representation, the value of the third option doesn't influence the firing rate here. And so the monkey's accuracy, making the blue-black choice, is uninfluenced by the existence of a red option, as long as the red option is never picked. But a system that employs normalization is not like that. As the value of the red option increases, it has the effect of drawing the firing rate distributions down, creating more overlap, and making it more difficult for the monkey to find the preferred option, even though he never chooses the red option ever. So Kenway and I designed this experiment and ran it, and I'm just going to show you uh, the data this way. This is essentially a choice curve. It's the monkey switching from preferring the right option to the left option. These are two monkeys. And the slope of this line tells us how certain he is, how quickly the changing values of the targets change his mind. And when we do this with just a very poor third option distracting him, or a very large third option distracting him, we can effectively confuse the monkey and make it harder for him to find the better option. I should say this is a huge effect if you plot it in terms of the errors they're making. The monkeys are switched from getting these, ex these uh, questions right about 80% of the time, 85% of the time, to getting them right only about 70% of the time. Now, I'll just skip through this. Now, of course, this raises immediately the question of whether this is true for humans as well. And Ken and I ran a group of experiments that have essentially the same feature, where humans choose between snack foods, they're hungry. This is exactly the same experiment. And we can use exactly the same theory. And we make exactly the same observations, that humans show these weird choice inefficiencies. And they show them as predicted by the critical normalization model. That's neat because the, our model now is doing better than any existing economic model to predict this class of behavior. And it's a model that comes directly out of the neurobiology. We can even extend the model to think about what happens when people encounter too many options. This is something known as the curse of choice. Here I'm showing you what happens to the choice probability, how accurate the monkey is, as we add additional low-value targets that the monkey will never take. And what I want you to see is how quickly performance degrades in the models. And it turns out that if we take those models to people, for the economists in the room, let me say that um, I'm not going to work you through the, I'm just going to show you a slide, but essentially what you have to do is an extremely detailed econometric model to capture the variance structures and the conditional choice probabilities. But when we do that, we can take a standard economic model shown in green, our observed data shown in red, and the neurobiological model, which actually has fewer parameters shown in blue, and what you can see is that the neurobiologically derived model is a better predictor for human choice behavior under these conditions in every possible way, and it's a much better predictor. Okay, so let me thank you for attention and finish up. So what we've learned over the course of the last decade or decade and a half in neuroeconomics is a pretty good outline of the basics of the choice mechanism. We know where stuff is represented. We know roughly how choice operates. And now we're getting to an extremely exciting place where a new thrust is to use that information to rebuild economic theory so that it represents not just pure economic theory, but the interaction of that theory with the realities of neuroscience and computational neuroscientific theory. Other speakers today will tell you about other kinds of exciting new neuroeconomics, challenging this standard early model, understanding how foraging works, understanding how we make decisions of the values of time, how we trade off things, how we trade off values, time, social relationships. All of these have impact that sweeps from the clinic to economic theory. And it's a really exciting time in a really rapidly growing area. And I, I know I speak for everyone in the NYU family when I say that we're super excited to bring this investigation to China 
and to begin to build real expertise and real competence so that China will be one of the great innovators as uh, neuroeconomics moves into its next decade. Thank you very much.